and welcome to Political Thinking. Who is doing the most to save the planet? Is it the people who are attaching themselves to those gantries above the M25 or throwing soup or mashed potato at old masters? Is it the political leaders and the lobbyists who've crammed into that resort in Egypt for the COP27 summits? Or is it the scientists who are trying to find ways that we can carry on living our lives but without catastrophically warming up the planet? I think it's fair to say that few would add to that list the leaders of the Green Party, which to some is a bit of a puzzle, given the increased concern there is about the environment and climate change. I'm joined this week on Political Thinking by the co-leader, one of two co-leaders of the Greens in England and Wales, Carla Denyer. She used to be an engineer, in fact, an engineer in wind farms, until she concluded that solving the climate crisis one turbine at a time wasn't going to work. She became a Green councillor in Bristol and was instrumental in making that the very first city to declare a climate emergency. Carla Denia joins me today. Welcome to Political Thinking. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Are you or have you ever been tempted to glue yourself to an old master or tie yourself onto a gantry? The way that I'm pursuing change is through party politics. Um, so I've not chosen to take that route myself. However, I do think there is a really important role for protest in any healthy democracy. You only have to look at the democracies that don't allow and stamp down on protest to see that that just doesn't make for, for a good society, for good political decision making. But my focus as the co-leader of the Green Party isn't on protest in the streets. It is on getting fantastic Green councillors, London Assembly members and MPs elected at all levels of government to enact the policies that will tackle climate change. It is that um, democratic route and protest is also democratic, but just at a personal level, is it something in your younger days that you were tempted to do? Is there a bit of you that looks at the people doing it now and think, well, if I was 18 again, I'd be doing it now? I have taken part in climate protests um, and I do think that's a really important part of the mix. I guess part of the reason that I'm pursuing uh, change through party politics is that I think that's where I personally can add the most value. I have a background as an engineer in the renewable energy sector, so I understand the science. Um, you know, I'm reasonably good with numbers and I think it's it's good to have people who understand the science and the maths in the decision making uh, halls of power, if you like, um, to, to, to raise the issues and to ask the questions that need to be asked. I definitely support their right to protest. Um, I think that's that's a key difference between the Green Party and the other political parties, that I think that, that their right to protest is essential Whatever the um, and has an important the role. However, that doesn't mean that I... Uh, agree with every protest that takes place? Certainly not. I think some of them are quite well targeted and make their point well. I think others perhaps have not really targeted at the right people or, uh, um, you know, the, the balance of disruption might not be what I would choose. But it's not for me to decide. Let's get a sense of how you became involved, how you became engaged, because your early campaigns when you're at school when you start to become, I suppose, small P political were not about the environment, were they? There were other causes. That's right. Um, so I kind of got involved in campaigns on particular issues uh, in sixth form, particularly. Uh, I was uh, part of the Stop the War campaign. So this was in the run up to the Iraq war. So you're 18, I think, at the time of Tony Blair and the Iraq war. Yeah. Yeah. That's all happening around the time that I'm um, doing my GCSEs and A-levels. Uh, and I, uh, I also uh, was involved in a campaign called Make Trade Fair. So listeners who are my age or older will remember that fair trade coffee and chocolate and bananas didn't used to be available in supermarkets. If you wanted to buy those products that were produced paying people a decent wage and in some cases avoiding child slavery, which seems like a no-brainer, but it was commonplace in those industries, then you had to usually go to a church hall for a particular two hours on a Saturday afternoon to get your fair trade chocolate bars. And you wanted your school canteen, the school shop, to be able to provide those? Uh, yeah, our, our sixth form canteen didn't provide those and we thought they should. And so me and a group of my friends uh, lobbied the college to, to change their suppliers. And initially... They said no, because the contract supplied not just our sixth form, but a number of others in the region. And so they said it would be too difficult. But long story short, 
we didn't take no for an answer the first time. And in the end, they said yes, not just for our sixth form, but for all of the educational establishments they supplied. So what did you learn then from that experience of taking on the school, taking on, I assume, the local authority as well? I think I learned that change is possible and that campaigning works. And even though I wasn't interested in party politics at that stage and had absolutely zero idea that I might one day be the leader of a political party, it undoubtedly led to a confidence in myself that I could bring about change. And then I got involved in subsequent campaigns at um, at my university, getting my college to provide recycling facilities. And then when I got elected as a councillor in Bristol. Confidence is a really important thing in politicians. And I've been told that one of the reasons you've got that confidence or did have them all those years ago is a teacher. Yes, yes. So I um, I went to uh, a regular state school, um, but it was a it was a really good state school, and um, in particular, this was during uh, the Blair era where he had uh, this uh, super teacher program. I think it was called. Basically, uh, recent Oxbridge graduates would be encouraged to go and teach um, in a state school for a couple of years before going off and doing something else. And my school received one of those, uh, and. This teacher, um, Mr. Horgan, if you're listening, um, he set up lots of extracurricular activities that um, perhaps the other teachers wouldn't have had capacity to do alongside their jobs otherwise. And one of those was a debating society, which is, yeah, very unusual in state schools. And so we learnt, uh, we learnt the skills of debating, you know, disagreeing politely, using logical arguments. Um, we competed with other schools in our region in which we were almost always the only state school in the competition, which is very telling. Uh, and I think that did give me um, give me experiences and skills that undoubtedly have proved proved helpful now. Did you come from a political family? <clears throat> no, I didn't come from a political family at all. And um, I certainly wasn't very interested in in capital P politics, party politics. No, you were a campaigner before you're interested in party politics, but you're also a Quaker. Is that important to your values? I discovered Quakerism when I was at university. I got involved in campaigns on peace, on on fairness and workers' rights with things like the Make Trade Fair campaign um, and on climate issues in sixth form and at university. And then it was through some of the individuals I met in those campaigns Actually, several individuals who I thought were particularly effective and driven and principled. And it turned out that several of them were also Quakers. And that made that piqued my interest and made me think, oh, OK, maybe there's something to this Quakerism thing. If all of these people I admire are members. Now, people who are watching will see, people who are listening won't, that alongside your red poppy, you're wearing a white poppy. That's right. Which, well, you say what you think it's a symbol of rather than me saying it. Well, I wear the red poppy to remember uh, service people who've fallen, of course, as, as many of us do. But I wear the white poppy to say never again and that we must work towards peace rather than just solving our disagreements through war and suffering. Is it's it a symbol of that. pacifism? Um, I probably wouldn't say I'm absolutely 100% pacifist. Like, I think that... Uh, I think that the UK is right to be supporting Ukraine at the moment, for example. Um, but it is absolutely a philosophy of, uh, of seeking peace and recognising that peace isn't just the absence of war. It is a proactive uh, movement and, and it's hard work, you know, that takes decades. And, and Quakers have often been at the heart of peace building work uh, all over the world. Uh, and I, I really value that about Quakerism and about the peace movement. So I wear both. You study engineering. You then get a job developing the technology that arguably is part of the solution to the climate crisis, wind turbines. Why, when you're doing that, do you not think, well, this is the answer. I'm at the cutting edge. Indeed, if I can find a better, cheaper way of developing renewable energy, that is the most important thing I can do. Well, that is what I thought to start with. And indeed, the work I was doing was about um, more accurately estimating how much energy a wind farm would generate or helping a developer decide how to lay out their wind farm, especially big offshore wind farms. Uh, and that work does help to bring down the cost of renewable energy. And so if they can make more money out of wind farms, then they're likely to build more of them. However, 
it was very, very obvious from watching the news and, and hearing what was coming out of uh, the earlier COP climate conferences that the UK and the world was not moving anything like fast enough on carbon reduction. And I could see um, from my job and from watching the news that the barrier to moving at the pace we need to was not technology. I mean, that you know, there are still some technological challenges that uh, very clever people are continuing to work on. But the real barrier to moving faster was political will of those in charge. And so I joined the Green Party a few years after I started working in the wind energy sector, um, initially with absolutely no intention of becoming a politician myself. It wasn't even a twinkle in my eye. Uh, it was literally just to give them, give the Green Party a little bit of money and a little bit of my volunteer time to help get other people elected because... I knew that the Green Party agreed with my views on this. And your first big campaign, and arguably big campaign success as well, is what people call divestment. So, in other words, persuading pension funds, the university in Bristol, uh, the city you were living in, and still live in, to take their funds out from investing in oil and gas companies. Now, arguably, it's just another way of just stopping oil. It's the same kind of philosophy behind it. Does it actually work, though? Yes, I think it does. It's really powerful. Um, and in fact, one of the experts that I was citing in the speeches I was writing and the documents I was submitting as part of my um, efforts to get the University of Bristol to divest um, was quoting Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England at the time, who was warning that um, investment in new oil and gas extraction at that time, um, which was 2015-16, is fiscally unwise, even if you don't care about climate change. Yeah, so it was very risky, wasn't it? Because you might find that your investment disappeared as people stop using fossil fuels. Yeah, well, the term is stranded assets because they're, the vast majority of the oil and gas that is under the ground and under the sea cannot be burnt. And so it is financial folly to invest in more oil and gas extraction, which, by the way, is why we're opposing the current Conservative mm. government investing in more oil and gas extraction right now. But the reason I ask you whether it can work is, look, clearly the campaigns worked. You were successful in Bristol. There were many around the country as well, persuading pension funds, universities and the right to withdraw their money. Um, a recent piece of academic research put it at 14 trillion US dollars of divestment. But meanwhile, investment in oil and gas has gone up during that time. So... All of that campaigning over all those years with all that money has not actually reduced the amount of money going into developing new oil and gas. So no campaign is effective in isolation. It's part of the wider picture. But I think the divestment movement is really powerful for a number of reasons. Firstly, those big institutions, and it is often um, yeah, universities, councils, religious institutions. Um, the Quake, I was also involved in the campaign to get Quakers in Britain to divest its funds from fossil fuels a few years earlier. Um, getting them to pass policies on divesting from fossil fuels means they need to find something else to invest in instead. And very often they will choose to invest in things that are positive for society and or for the climate. Um, so that might be renewable energy or it might be other social goods like uh, affordable housing, for example. That's, that's a, a fairly stable long-term investment for things like pension funds. The language of climate emergency is pretty familiar to people now. I mean, even the Conservative government under Theresa May adopted that language. But when you first argued for it in Bristol, I imagine it wasn't well known and there was quite a job for you to do of persuading people that that language would make a difference. That's right. Yeah, so in 2018, I wrote and proposed a motion to Bristol City Council calling on it to declare a climate emergency to bring forward the city's carbon neutral target date from 2050 to 2030 and to lobby the government for the powers and the funding necessary to achieve that goal. And this is, although the specific idea of declaring a climate emergency was pretty new, um, my motion, which was successful, was the first in Europe. Uh, and since then, Hundreds of other organisations have followed suit. Um, about three quarters of UK councils have now uh, declared a climate emergency and many of them with ambitious carbon targets as well. Let's turn to the role you've got now, which is of co-leader of, of, of the Greens. What's interesting, I read your conference speech, which you gave with your fellow leader, Adrian Ramsey, 
And yes, at the centre of it was an idea for this big tax on the wealthy to pay for more insulation, for example. Um, but when I read through it, there was a lot more on inequality. There was a lot more on what you called fairness than there was on the climate emergency. When I read your tweets that you've done in the last few days before doing this interview, they're not about the climate. They're about a whole series of other issues about the Tory government's behaviour on this or that. Have you actually become an anti-capitalist party rather than primarily an environmental party? So the Green Party has always been about climate and fairness. Uh, and in fact, the reason I joined the party back in 2011 was because I realised that unlike the other political parties, the Greens understood that climate justice and economic and social and racial justice are inextricably linked. They have some of the same the injustices have some of the same causes and many of the solutions are the same. And so they have to be tackled as one. My question was quite specific. Are you an anti-capitalist party? Um, views would probably differ, but, but slightly between different members. But I think we are certainly very sceptical uh, of capitalism as, uh, as an economic system. Um, I was looking and, at your motions. Yes, go for it. Uh, it's a very democratic party. Indeed. And therefore, you can't, as a leader, just make up policy. EC 201. It calls really for the end. this thoroughly. <laughs> to the end of the current dependence on economic growth, you say. You want to allow, and I quote, zero or negative growth. Mm -hmm. So your pitch to people is we want the economy to get smaller. Well, what we actually want is for certain sectors like renewables and insulation, for example, to grow and they need to grow rapidly in order to meet the needs of society. But that is what but that means, that isn't does it? If you mean... want zero or negative growth, you mean the economy over the years gets smaller? It's not about proactively pursuing an, um, economic degrowth so much as being uh, agnostic about the particular measure of GDP growth, gross domestic product, because GDP is a terrible measure of how an economy is doing and how a society is doing. The reason I ask it, you see, is it seems to me a problem that the Green Party's always had, which you yourself talked about, was being seen as middle class. There is a direct link between people who can think they can call for the economy to get smaller and class, which is it's the sort of things that people are relatively comfortable off are very comfortable sitting around debating, but people who are not very comfortably off would never dream of saying, I want the economy to get smaller. Well, you've, you've very nearly touched on there why I think that uh, climate justice and economic justice have to be tackled hand in hand, because we want to see redistribution. We want to uh, bring in a wealth tax um, because that would help tackle the gross injustices in this country where the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. A wealth tax, quite a modest wealth tax is what we proposed at our conference, uh, just 1% um, only on wealth above £3.4 million pounds, and that would go to all of the stuff I've been talking about earlier, uh, installing more renewable energy, um, a nationwide home installation programme, that would help those on the lowest incomes. Yeah. And we have, we have other you taxes. You did say that the Greens were too middle class, didn't you? Well... <laughs> I acknowledge that that's the perception. I think it's in increasingly at odds with reality. So, for example, in Bristol, where I'm a councillor, I'm one of 24 Green councillors on Bristol City Council, largest ever group of Greens, Green councillors in the UK, in fact. And uh, our group of Green councillors is really diverse. We've got um, quite a few councillors from working class backgrounds, very proudly so. Um, we also have a great diversity in terms of um, yeah, age, sexuality, etc. Um, and I think that is really good because it results in better quality decisions when you've got a wider diversity. So what? I agree that it's a challenge for the environmental movement, but I do think it's one that we are getting better and better at including more people in the discussion. You must have thought, though, why hasn't there been the growth in green politics. Now, some will say it's the, the voting system, which obviously is very cruel to smaller parties with their votes spread evenly around the country. But on the other hand, that didn't stop UKIP doing extraordinarily well. Why do you think the Green Party hasn't done better? Well, the political system certainly doesn't help. Um, so the first-past-the-post system 
um, is, uh, yeah, very disproportionate in terms of um, the number of seats you win for the number of votes. Uh, and um, interesting fact, I don't know if you know this, the UK is one of only two European countries that still uses first past the post for general elections. The other one is Belarus, um, which is a pretty corrupt um, borderline dictatorship. I'm, I'm inviting you to look in the political mirror. What is it the parties? I mean, you're relatively new as a co-leader. What is it you're thinking to yourself, well, I've got to change this if I'm going to get more success? Mm. Well, I'm happy to look in the mirror, but let me just answer your question as well. Part of the part of the challenge um, is being given the opportunity to to speak on the media. So thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. Um, but for example, um, there hasn't been a leader of the Green Party on Question Time since 2019. Um, and yet we have more councillors now than UKIP did at its peak, at which point Nigel Farage was on Question Time every couple of months. OK, so let's look in the mirror. There let's is look a, in the mirror now. <laughs> there is a, there is You've a, made the an pitch. exposure Look point. in the mirror. What's the problem? Um, I think we also... Um, have uh, are on a learning curve about how to communicate our policies clearly. Um, I think we're getting better at that now. Um, I think that, um, yeah, like a few years ago, uh, the leaflets that we would put through doors might be a bit too verbose. The dream must be that you, perhaps, I mean, you're only, what, in your late 30s, could emulate the foreign minister of Germany, who's leader of the Green Party there, and Alina Baerbock. Is that the sort of hope you would have, albeit that there are a lot of steps to take along the way. Absolutely. And you don't have to look as far as Germany to see examples because our uh, sister party, the Scottish Greens, are in government in Scotland um, and getting great policies through such as free bus travel for uh, all young people, um, bringing in a rent freeze and an eviction ban over this winter to protect people who are um, at risk of eviction because of the cost of living crisis. Those are the kind of policies that Greens in government can bring about. And I'm chomping at the bit to, to, to do the same in England and Wales. It's interesting that she, the Green um, Foreign Minister of Germany, is a leading campaigner for more defence spending, defending Ukraine. Now, I was interested that you said that as a Quaker... As someone who's, as you put it, I think, not 100% pacifist, you said you were in favour of the war in Ukraine. In favour meaning you think British arms should be sent to defend Ukrainians I didn't Russia? say I'm in favour of war. I said I think it's right for the UK to support Ukraine because... Understood. Of course... What's you, the difference, though? What's the, what's the point you're trying to make by making that distinction? Well, Ukraine is a sovereign country and has an absolute right to defend its borders and Russia has breached those and has invaded Ukraine. So it's absolutely right that Ukraine should be able to defend itself and that the international community supports Ukraine in doing so. Um, but uh, I, I feel that's quite different to being in favour of wars. Um, I want to see um, I want to see the world move towards rather than mutually assured destruction and threats of violence to solve mm. problems, I want to see a global security architecture, um, and maybe the UN could be the beginning of that, where where the default is solving things through negotiation more than it is currently. And it's a while, I guess, before you can see yourself being the foreign minister. It would require a change of voting system. It would require a coalition. I disagree with that. Oh, go on. Well, um... I'm uh, standing in, in Bristol West, um, which is, uh, yeah, the constituency that I stood in last general election as well in 2019, where I came second and got more votes than any Green has ever got in the UK other than Caroline Lucas in Brighton. Uh, and um, we have every chance of uh, getting me elected as the first Green MP in Bristol next time around. And then? Especially and with then? the... Well, I was just going to say, especially with the boundary changes, which have just sure. been announced, but, which... Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then, though, I mean, because I said there was a long way before you, you might become a member of parliament, you might not. But you quibbled with my suggestion that there was quite a long way before you might dream of becoming the foreign secretary in this country. Why did you quibble with that? Why do you think change may happen quickly? Well, based on where polling is at the moment, it doesn't look likely that we're going to have another conservative government. Um, the exact complexion of the new government will it's hard to predict at this stage. A lot's going to change probably between now and the next general election. Um, but uh, I would be 
very happy to work with um, other uh, left-wing and centre-left parties to form a, a coalition government. I would negotiate hard to make sure that we learned um, lessons of, of where Greens have gone into government elsewhere. So in Scotland, for example, um, the Scottish Greens negotiated a really good deal with the SNP where they managed to get really firm commitments out of the SNP and reserve the right to publicly differ on areas they disagree on, like North Sea oil and gas. Mm. And so it's it's absolutely possible that we could have Greens in government after the next election. Um, and if so, you look forward to doing it. And, I, your, and I'd be very happy finally, to work with other parties. What would be your fantasy job? If you could have any job in government. Uh, well, I think given my background in the energy sector, I would love to be energy minister. <laughs> Carla Denny, we can't make your dream come true, but thanks for talking to me on Political Thinking. Thank you. Given the speed of change that we've seen in the past few years in politics, no, the past few weeks, for goodness sake, it really isn't as far-fetched as some people will think for Carla Denia to dream that she might be an MP in government and even the energy minister. She is inspired others will look to, the success of the Greens in Scotland and, of course, the powerful role played by the Greens in the new-ish German government. Thanks for watching.